Welcome to the vigil in honor of Xiyue Wang. My name is Ida Knox, and I'm going to be helping introduce our speakers today. I appreciate each and every one of you who is here, and we appreciate the coverage that this event has. We feel like it truly deserves it. Um, Xiyue Wang, if you do not know, um, was a UW Jackson School alumnus. He graduated from the Jackson School. I know we've got a couple of Jackson School representatives here. And he was a PhD student at Princeton University. He is currently unjustly detained in Iran, and he has been there for 946 days. We are here to thank you and also to spend this time in solidarity with his family and his friends in support to raise awareness about his plight and to call to action the government and community members to help get him out. We would like to specifically call to action Washington state government, the national government, and the international community. I'm here with my teammates on this case, Kenzie Legg, David Wong, Alejandra Ganza. We work with the International Human Rights Clinic here at the University of Washington Law School on this case. A little bit of housekeeping for the event. You all know the exit, which is what you came in. And also, if you could silence your cell phones, please feel free to take pictures. Um, but if you could turn off any ringers or loud notifications, we've got some moments of silence and we would really like to preserve those. Thank you. Xiu Wang is a student. He is not a spy. You will learn a lot about his case today and you will learn a lot about the situation that he's in and his family. He had permission from the Iranian government to study in the country. And yet, while he was conducting his research on 19th century history, he was arrested and sentenced to 10 years in Iranian prison. The UN has called his arrest and detention arbitrary and unjust and recommended his release. Thank you for joining us today in solidarity as we work towards U.S. freedom and his return to his family and to the United States. Today we have several speakers who will be joining us, as well as a video from Xiu's wife, Hua Tu, who could not join us today. We do have his mother in attendance, Kashu Lan. We also have representatives from Governor Inslee's office, Congresswoman Jayapal's office, Senator Murray and Cantwell's, Congressman Smith's office, and we've received support from the Seattle City Council and Human Rights Commission, as well as many others. First up, to introduce this case to you and bring it to a really, truly human perspective, we have a video from Xiyue's wife, Hua, and his son, Xiaofen. We think that this video will really show you a little bit more about the case and introduce to you some of the people whose lives are directly impacted by his unjust detention. Xiyue embarked on his academic journey, starting from his first day at the University of Washington his dream school to study the South Asian languages and history. The University of Washington provided him an unparalleled portal to access and share knowledge about this world. Xiu has an innate drive to study the Eurasia continent, which grew from the years he studied at the University of Washington. Xiu often talks fondly about the seminars he had with his professors at the Asian Language and Literature Department at Govan Hall and the unforgettable day spent at the Stacks um, at the Zuzello Library. <coughs> I'm deeply grateful for everything the University of Washington has been doing towards U.S. liberty. I would also like to thank all the speakers and every one of you who made phone calls or read letters or raise awareness by all means um, to the plight of our family. Thank you. I'm also very grateful for the care and support the state of Washington provided to my mother-in-law during this prolonged crisis and your continued support to her. It means a lot to Xi Yue, who was sentenced to 10 years on false charges of espionage and has been unjustly held in Evan prison for more than two and a half years. That doubles the time the American diplomats were held between 1979 and 1981. 
Xu's only alleged crime is his research for his PhD dissertation. My husband was persecuted for his scholarship and criminalized for his American citizenship. So far, neither the Obama administration in power when he was taken, nor the Trump administration has seriously engaged in talks with the Iranian government. It is obvious that the life of one American does not attract the political will required for decisive action to be taken for his rightful freedom. Xu's imprisonment is a humanitarian tragedy, and his release should be tra treated as a humanitarian necessity with urgency. My family does not deserve to be caught up as a pawn in world politics. And having been in this crisis for nearly three years, I would like to call upon the US government and all world leaders to do everything to secure Xi's release as soon as possible. His health is deteriorating, which worried me a lot. I also plead for the gate of mercy to be, to be opened for his liberty and the reunion of my family. Like all children in this world, Xiaofan needs his father. Our son Xiaofan turned six this year and has lost his uh, first baby tooth. Um, Xue has missed more than half of our son's young life and I'm doing all I can for his return. But years pass and nothing I do is enough. I'm grateful for the solidarity and the support from the university and the state of Washington. Every action helps. Thank you so much. So as you can see, these are real lives and real people that could be any of us who are being impacted by this. Um, I would like to introduce our first speaker today, Alejandra Gonza. Alejandra is the director of the International Human Rights Clinic here at the University of Washington, where she, as her entire team can attest, has worked tirelessly on this case and is a wonderful advocate and a wonderful teacher. So if you could join me in welcoming her. Thank you so much. Uh, it is touching to see you all here. We need your help. We do. Thank you for choosing being here this evening. Your presence, solidarity, and action are all extremely powerful. And I hope today you can find your place in this fight. You have one. Talk to us. We will help you. Um, with my talented students, you've seen them working really hard, right? They are amazing, and with the International Human Rights Clinic, we represent Keshu Lan. She was mother before International Human Rights Organization. Keshu, she's a US citizen. She's a longtime Washington resident, and she is a fighter. And as you can see, this is not an easy fight. She has to fight with many obstacles on her way. Those obstacles are even being living here in Seattle, and not in Washington, D.C., nor in New York, in Geneva, or in Tehran, where everything is decided in this case. It is very difficult. But it's a privilege, an honor, representing you, Keshu. Cases of wrongful conviction of U.S. citizens abroad bring all the complexities of international human rights law to the table. Which country is responsible? Why? And most important, how to get all those responsible actors to comply with their duties to protect and respect US rights? Those are very difficult questions. The first layer, it's Iran. Of course, Iran is responsible, responsible for violating US human rights and using him as a political pawn. Iran signed and ratified many international human rights instruments and committed to comply with decisions from the bodies created to enforce them. The clinic supported Keshu to file a case before the United Nations Working Group on Arbitrary Detention. And in August 2018, we won the case, right? 
for those not familiar with what I'm talking about, and usually nobody is familiar with the UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention, right? Even my students, like, until we find what it is and what the powers that they do have, right? Um, it is an independent body with the mandate to decide cases like this one impartially. It is a process where individuals and governments can participate equally. Iran engaged in the process and lost. The UN Working Group on the Arbitrary Detention found that she was illegally uh, detained, and he was detained because of his scholarly work and his US nationality. While this international decision is a really important achievement, it still must lead to a second requirement for his release. And that requirement is very difficult. It is political will. Political will from Iran, political will from the United States, and of course, from the international community. So that was the first layer, Iran responsibility. But we have the United States. That's a US country. He is a US citizen. And the United States, as his, as his country, has the obligation to use every legal and diplomatic tool available to bring him home. And all those efforts have been made, they were not enough. And at the moment, they are not pursuing direct dialogue with Iran. And we know that's the only way we can bring him home, talking. We can't have a family tra trapped in this geopolitics. No matter how deteriorated Iran and US relationships happen to be, the countries can and must talk about human rights, about this case, and resolve it. There's a third layer on um, actors that can be responsible too and do have a role to play. Um, that third layer is the international community. Many nations appear to have foreign, uh, their own citizens in prison in Iran unjustly detained. We need political pressure to trigger the political will. And we need multilateral cooperation, including all nations in a position to help. It is possible to have talks with Iran based solely in human rights grounds and international law. We have a place to do that, too. Hostage taken is an international crime. And Iran's practice should not be tolerated by any nation. And it comes here, the other layer, the United Nations. That's where this could happen, too. And the United Nations needs to become more involved on in pressuring Iran to come to the table and make this happen. Finally, and I always tell my students that international decisions are, more, are most effective when we have implementation at the local level, right? We domesticate these international decisions and we bring them home. But in Iran, there's no rule of law for Shiwe. He has no chance to win his case in a court there. He was subject to a sham of a trial, and there's no due process possible of, of judicial overview for him. That is why we turn to local officials here in our state to help implementing the United Nations important decision ordering his release. You all have here an important role to play, and we are going to help you play that role. We have to walk hand in hand, and we have to go to the United Nations together. From the city of Seattle to the state of Washington, we have the power to build the political pressure that is needed to end this nightmare. As time passes and we are reaching the 946th day of Shiwa's imprisonment, we are required to be creative and fi find new pathways to bring him home. We need to urge the US government, the international community, our beloved state of Washington, our own university here, to work through all viable possible solutions. And before I end this, what I would like to say is that we need to bring hope to this family. And hope can, can be brought with a lot of actions. 
the hope is that we know, and I am sure and I'm positive, political prisoners come back home. I am a daughter of a former political prisoner in Argentina. I was probably a shell fan throwing a picture next to my mom and my two other siblings while she was fighting fiercely to bring him home to Argentina. So I have the hope that Xiao Fang and Chi Wei will be our next guest here because I know it's possible and I know with all the help and your support, you're gonna be part of this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ali. Ali has been instrumental in teaching us as students at this law school to be global advocates and to stand up for human rights here and abroad. I would like to introduce our next speaker. Um, as Ali mentioned, support is so instrumental on every level for this case, and we are happy to have here support from Governor Jay Inslee's office. We appreciate that support, um, and we appreciate the statement that will be read on his behalf. Um, so if you would please join me in welcoming Skylar Haas, the Director of International Affairs and Protocol on behalf of Governor Jay Inslee. Thank you. <clears throat> I want to first extend my heartfelt appreciation to many of you here in the room that have worked so hard for so long to obtain the release of our Washingtonian Xi Yu. We have had several meetings in regard to this subject. Uh, Mom and I met uh, a while back to discuss how this is impacting her family. And Governor Inslee has been very involved in terms of communicating with the United Nations and the US Congress to try and get relief for this unacceptable situation. I really wish that I was not here today, having to still continue to advocate on behalf of Xi Yue and his release. I uh, said to mom a while back that I hope the next time we get together, we have a celebration of our accomplishment. Again, Governor Inslee has been very involved in trying to informally uh, work the uh, complex levels of involvement that uh, Ali mentioned. We have uh, had a great deal of conversation about how to best do this, and now we recognize that coming out publicly and strongly in support of this effort is critical. And I'm going to read some excerpts from a statement that uh, Governor Ish Inslee has issued. I learned a long time ago when I read each and every sentence, the poor people in the back of the room, their eyes start rolling. But uh, <laughs> uh, there are some important points that uh, the governor did want me to communicate. And this, again, is a letter of statement from the governor. I wish to convey my serious concerns about the status and treatment of Xu Ei Wang, currently detained by the government of the Islamic Republic of Iran. Xi Yue and his family have strong ties to Washington, his mother, wife, and son being from our state. He was also a graduate student at the University of Washington prior to pursuing his studies at Princeton University. Xi Yue was in Iran solely for the purpose of scholarly research in connection with his PhD dissertation. He was studying old historical records pertaining to the cultural history of Iran. Princeton University provided financial support for his research from funds that were entirely under its control with no involvement of any kind from the United States government or any outside agencies. Before traveling to Iran, Xi Yue sent letters explaining his research plan to the Iranian interest section of the Embassy of Pakistan in Washington, D.C., and was issued a valid visa. He was completely transparent about what he wanted to study and why. Xi Yue was not involved in any political activities or social activism. The Iranian government has charged Xi Yue with espionage under its criminal code, and I am not aware of any available evidence that supports these charges. Princeton University, the University of Washington, and others consider these charges to be completely false. Xi Yue's wife and mother filed a petition with the United Nations Working Group on Arbitrary Detention calling for his immediate release. The petition asserts 
that his trial suffered from substantive and procedural defects and that his detention violates both Iranian and international law. I am deeply concerned about the treatment he has received while detained in Iran, and I have encouraged the United Nations and the United States government to take every possible action to obtain his release. In addition to protecting the rights of US citizens, this matter warrants attention because it infringes on the freedom of academic researchers to study, learn, and discover. When politics encroaches on academic freedoms, it should be of serious concern to all of us. Xiyue needs to be returned to the United States and reunited with his family. I will continue to advocate on his behalf, and I encourage all Washingtonians to support efforts in this regard. And again, this is a formal statement from Governor Jay Inslee. Thank you very much. Thank you. We, we really appreciate it, and we appreciate Governor Inslee's public support in this matter. As you guys have heard and will continue to hear, this is a case that touches lives. It touches all parts of Washington. And I'm really, um, it's very personal to think of it as, as a student. Um, for those of us who study international law here and who study at the Jackson School and who are involved in all levels of advocacy that the University of Washington so heavily encourages us to be involved in, um, as we planned for this, we really just kept having the resounding thought that it could have been me and it could have been Kenzie or David or any of us that was in this position. Um, and with that in mind, I'm happy to introduce our next sp speaker, Linda Eltis. She is speaking on behalf of the Jackson School and on behalf of Professor Rasat Kasaba, the Stanley D. Golub Chair and Director of the Jackson School of International Studies here at the University of Washington. If you could join me in welcoming her. Thank you all for coming today uh, to show your, su your husky support for UW Jackson School and Asian Languages and Literature alumnus Chi Wei Wang. I want to keep that in there too because he did a double degree here at UW. Um, a big thanks to our Washington State representatives and leaders, Governor Inslee and UW President Anna Marie Kause and Jackson School Director Rashad Kasaba, who I work with on a daily basis. Um, before reading his statement, I'm going to read my own statement. <laughs> um, in August of 2016, Shi Wei's mother, Kushu, came to my office in the Jackson School in the, in the late, I think it was August or September, to ask if I remembered her son, Shi Wei. And he, he had last been here in 2006. Shi Wei had asked her to reach out to the Jackson School for help because he'd been detained in Evan Prison. In a complete state of shock, my heart sank. How could I forget such a wonderful person and excellent student who brightened my office every time he visited with his exuberance for learning languages and cultures of Asia? As an academic like Shi Wei, I studied Asian languages, history, and culture. Like Shi Wei, my doctoral research and ongoing research required extensive archival research abroad in Nepal. Um, archival research is what enhances the quality of scholarship. It is the very foundation of historical research. Archival research informs us of the human condition through time and builds mutual understanding among all human beings. Academic freedom is essential for humanity to thrive peacefully. Shi Wei had all the permissions to visit and do research in the archives. That's a big thing when you have doing doctoral research. Everybody does that. He is an honest and careful scholar. Guided by the highest academic and ethical standards, he is one of the most thoughtful and humanitarian and caring advisees I've known in all my 30 years here at UW. This is why I'm especially moved to act, to let others know 
to shed light on this hidden treasure. He is brilliant. And I, I can't say it enough that Shi Wei is really a brilliant scholar. And to see him in, in prison is just heart wrenching. Shi Wei is a proud husky, fueled by a deep appreciation and love of languages, cultures, and history. He is respectful and caring toward all whom he meets, a loving father, husband, and son. Shi Wei really is in need of our support, your support. Write a message to him today to let him know you care. His family can relay your concern let your representatives know you want them to keep on this. The power of your support cannot be underestimated. Every little bit helps. Imagine sitting in a prison cell subjected to abuse from inmates. Imagine enduring that for months and now years. Shi Wei needs every bit of hope he can, we can offer him. He actually phoned me and he is currently studying Tibetan and Tibetan history on top of everything else he's studied to keep himself engaged and motivated. What a great idea. I wish he'd studied Tibetan here too because we have a great <laughs> Tibetan. Okay, but anyway, uh, my prayer is for Shi Wei to be reunited as soon as possible with his family and for him to finish his PhD and to continue his writing and teaching I hope he will visit UW when he comes back. As Huskies, we know how effective vocal communication can be. We howl, network, and let others in the pack and neighboring packs know to take action and spread the word. We are all human beings. Academic freedom matters to all of us. Support his mother, Kushu, support Wachu, his wife, and support his son, Xiaofan and free Shi Wei. Um, <clears throat> I'm very happy to have an opportunity to read a statement from Professor Kasaba, who could not be here today because this is the end of the year capstone sequence thing with task forces in the Jack Jackson School. But he provided us with a letter, so I'll read it. He says, I'm sorry I cannot join you today to express my support for Shi Wei Wang. He needs to be released immediately and returned to his family and to his scholarship. It is through the courses he took at the Jackson School that Shi Wei has learned the value and importance of studying foreign languages and cultures. Shi Wei's imprisonment sends precisely the wrong message to his peers and students who need all the encouragement they can get to pursue deep knowledge of their civilizations to enhance our collective understanding. I hope that the Iranian government will do its part in opening up new bridges across our divided world, especially in these days of growing suspicion and hostility. On behalf of my colleagues and students at the Jackson School, I join numerous individuals and organizations around the world to demand the immediate release of our former student, Shi Wei Wang, Ishaq Kasaba. Thank you very much. Thank you, Linda. Um, in, in keeping with the Jackson School and keeping with the many things that Shi Wei was and continues to be, he was a friend. And I hope that you can all join me in welcoming one of his friends and a former fellow classmate, both here at the Jackson School and at Princeton while he was getting his PhD. If you could join me in welcoming Alexa Simon. Hi, thank you guys for coming. Um, indeed, uh, I'm here to talk about my friend. This is an important case for human rights and for academic freedom everywhere. And it is also important to me because this is my friend, Xie Wang. I first met Xie at Princeton, just after he'd been accepted by the history department. We talked about our research interests, and Xie told me that he'd worked as a translator in Central Asia, and now he wanted to learn the history of the region so that he could understand it better. 
When I found out that he was from UW, and even better that we were both Jackson School grads, I tried extra hard to convince him to come join our department. Not that it mattered. Turns out Xiue already knew exactly what he wanted to study and who he wanted to study it with, and he'd already decided he was coming to Princeton. After he started classes, I saw him around campus a lot. He was always extra busy, balancing his studies with childcare while his wife was at work in New York. But he was usually pretty cheerful about it. I'd ask how classes and prepping for calls was going, and he wouldn't complain the way most of us, myself included, would. Instead, he was always genuinely excited to talk about his research and his giant reading lists for quals and what he was learning in his classes. Historians are a pretty nerdy bunch in general, and even by our standards, Shiwei is a little bit of a nerd. Uh, he's also friendly and funny and you know, personable. He's a great guy to have a beer with, so long as you don't mind talking about history while you drink. Um, this, of course, made him well-liked in our department, his enthusiasm, his sense of humor, the fact that we all envied the like, half dozen languages that he speaks. Um, and in fact, he even used this sort of historical enthusiasm to win over his wife, Hua, who told me once that all of their early dates involved going to bookstores, where he would take her up and down the shelves of the history section, and he would just pull books off the shelf that he was excited about, and he would tell her, all this like, interesting, exciting stories from those books. So like I said, that's the kind of guy he is. He just loves learning. When we learned that Xiu was in prison and had been for months, the entire department was in shock. We all wanted to help however we could. We inundated poor Hua with our offers of help. And it turned out that there was something, according to Xiu and Hua and his advisor, that his classmates at Princeton could do to help. You see, there were a bunch of research materials on his desk, mostly in Cyrillic. And if we could make photocopies and mail them to him in prison, that would be great. Because you see, he might be stuck in a freezing prison, but he still wants to finish his dissertation. Because like I said, that's the kind of guy he is. So if this can happen to Xie, like it was already said before, this can happen to any of us. Xie went to Iran to read old archival documents about the 19th century Qajar dynasty. This is what historians do. We go find rare books and old documents, whether in Beijing or Tehran or Nepal or the basement of Suzlo Allen. And we read them and we try to share what we've learned in the hopes that better remembering our past will help us all understand our present. We historians, academics, we like to believe that we're doing important work and it is important work. A world where scholars are arbitrarily and unjustly imprisoned is a world with more fear and with less understanding. We should all be concerned about the impact that Xi's case has on human rights and on academic freedom. I think about the precedent that this sets, and I feel this sort of terrified, overwhelming need to speak up, for all of us to speak up and defend the work and the values that we've dedicated so much of our lives to. But I also think about my friend who studied in Suzlo and to classes in Thompson and who worked over the summers to pay his tuition here, who was so excited to talk about his research and the latest thing that he read for Qualls, and who's now imprisoned over 6,000 miles away, far from his mother and far from his wife, and from his five-year-old son who's having to start kindergarten without his dad. My friend who is hungry and cold and lonely and isn't getting adequate medical care, and he's there reading photocopies of his old library books and apparently also studying Tibetan and so that he can keep doing the research that he loves and finish his dissertation, because that's the kind of guy he is. Thank you. A bookstore sounds like a perfect first date. <laughs> Thank you, Alexis. It's really great to hear from people who knew Shua throughout his life and in a variety of different ways. Um, before we hear on behalf of Shiwa's mother, we have one final statement to read. Um, this is from the president of the University of Washington, Anna Marie Kose, and her statement, which we so greatly appreciate and feel is instrumental and important to support our alumni, will be read by the director of the International Human Rights Cl Clinic, Alejandra Gonza. Thank you so much. This was a clear example on how a little help turns into more help. Professor Iltis, I knock on my office almost 
a year and a half ago with Keshu. So she didn't stop at, at meeting Keshu in her office. She reached out for more help, and then we reached out to others. So I encourage you to continue helping. I would read a statement on behalf of President uh, of the University of Washington, Anna Marie Gosse. <clears throat> I regret that I am not able to be with you all in support of our colleague and alumnus, Ji Wei Wang. But please know that I join you in calling for his immediate release. The University of Washington is proud to count Xi Wei as a graduate of our institution, and there is no reason to doubt that his purpose in visiting Iran was the pure pursuit of his fields of scholarship. Leaders and human rights advocates across the UDAV and around the world recognize that Xi Wei is being unjustly detained. His detention is not only a profound injustice for him and his beloved, family, but it is an encroachment on the freedom of students and scholars everywhere who wish to advance research and knowledge in Iran. Such scholarship has the potential to benefit the whole world. And when academic freedom is made a prisoner to politics, everyone, everyone loses. I urge the Iranian government to free Xi Wan. And this is the closing of President Kaus's statement. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, everyone who has been here today. Um, we would like to thank a few additional people uh, before we hear uh, a statement from Shira's mother. And we invite you all after that to join us in a candlelight vigil and a slideshow of some of the most adorable pictures of a six-year-old that I've ever seen, among other things. Um, so thank you all so much. It means so much to us. It means so much to Shiwa's family to see you here in support. We would additionally like to thank um, a couple of other offices who have sent representatives to be here in support of Shiwa and his family. We would like to thank Ramon Khanna, who is here on behalf of Congresswoman Jayapal, we would like to thank Megan Utemi, who is here representing Senator Murray's office, Madison Brown, representing Senator Cantwell's office, Glenn Carpenter from Congressman Smith's office, and we would like to thank the Seattle University School of Law and the SBA President Efrain Hudnall um, and the Seattle U students who joined us here today. It means a lot to have the community come together and support. We thank you for your continued support and hard work and commitment. And as Alejandro Gonza has mentioned, this is not just to thank you, this is not a case that is over and this is not an issue that disappears after we walk out of this room today. To our Washington delegation and the supporters who are here with us, we urge you to continue to work towards a joint congressional letter to send to President Trump and the Secretary of State Pompeo, urging them to engage in direct diplomatic dialogue with Iran based on humanitarian grounds, and to ask Iran for Shia's release during the next United Nations Universal Periodic Review. Continued advocacy is key, and we cannot let his name fall out of circulation. We are going to continue our engagement towards these goals, and we thank you for your continued support. I would now like to welcome my colleague, Kenzie Legg, who will be reading a statement on behalf of Shiwe's mother, Kashu Lan, to the stage. Thank you. Thank you all again for being here. It, it very much means the world to us. Um, it is my distinct pleasure to speak on behalf of Shi Wei's mom. Um, she'll be coming up at the very end, but uh, before she does that, I would love to read a statement on her behalf. Um, Kashu says, I would like to thank all of you for your support for Shi Wei and for my family. My son is a very hardworking student and he is innocent. Shi Wei and I are American citizens and our family needs your help. We ask the U.S. government and President Trump to bring my son back, using all available tools and engaging in direct diplomatic dialogue on human rights grounds. My dear friends, Xi Wei is still having a very difficult time in prison, but he feels stronger when he knows that the University of Washington and the University of Princeton University, excuse me, are standing behind him in solidarity. 
He wants me to tell you that he deeply loves you, Dub, and he deeply loves all of you. No matter how old my son is, he will always be my baby. We need to keep fighting to bring him home. We will never give up. Thank you to President Ana Marie Casa. Thank you, Skyler, on behalf of Governor Inslee. Thank you, Congresswoman Jaya Paul. Thank you, Senators Murray and Cantwell. Thank you, Congressman Smith. Thank you, Seattle City Council and Seattle Human Rights Commission. Thank all of you in the audience today. We will keep fighting. Make my family whole again. Um, today I wear a red uh, clothing. That um, in Chinese meaning like uh, um, good luck and uh, uh, hope. So that's this is a special. And uh, also I want to thank you very much. Thank you you all very much, and support my son and uh, help us. Really, really, deeply, deeply, thanks very much. So, um, thank you. I Give me one moment to set up um, our next technical thing. Also, if you guys have your candles ready, feel free to. Yeah. So Kenzie is going to get our slideshow set up. Thank you, Kashu, so much. It has been an absolute honor to get to know Shiwe through his mother. She is strength and fortitude personified. And it has been a humbling and honored experience to work with her and advocate for her son. You guys have been handed out little candles. Um, we are going to dim the lights in a moment and play a slideshow so that we can add some faces and some humanity uh, to this situation, and I think some hope as well. Um, the music behind this slideshow is a little bit special, and I thought I would say a few <laughs> words to introduce it. Um, when we asked Kashu, what song could we play that would really bring meaning and movement to these images, and, and what would really have been meaningful to Shiwa, she didn't hesitate. She said, oh, Beethoven's Fifth. <laughs> And we were like, OK, great. Um, and the story behind that uh, uh, almost brought me to tears. When Shiwa was very little, uh, he went to one of Kashu's friends' houses. And it was his first time to ever hear this song. Um, and for the rest of the day, he didn't say anything. Uh, and when he finally spoke, when Kashu finally asked him why he wasn't speaking, it was because the song was the most beautiful thing that he had ever heard, and he wasn't really sure how to respond to it. So that's the level of beauty and the level of intellect and the level of humanity that we're fighting for. Um, and we join you guys, and we thank you so much for being here. Um, so please raise a candle. Um, and. Listen to Beethoven's fifth. <laughs> 